It's fantastic for the International Peace Bureau to be here and for this ceremony to be hosted here in the city of Geneva. And my co-president, Rainer Brown, and myself will be with you for this ceremony uh, in which we will honor Jeremy Corbyn. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and dear friends, I first would like to welcome Jeremy Coburn. Jeremy, it is a great pleasure that you can make it between all your many events, many activities to join us this evening. And I think the IPB and we all are proud to be with you tonight. And I would also thank the city of Geneva for their great help and support. The city, I think, which is deeply connected to peace, human rights, and political dialogue. And I think it's a great place to be here and to be with you. And I have the great honor now to announce and to give the word to the mayor of the city, Ray May Pegani, the mayor of Geneva. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you. The floor is to you. Recipient of the Sean McBride 2017 prize, I've already mispronounced uh, Sean McBride anyway. Uh, Sean McBride 2017 prize, Madam Secretary General of the International Trade Union Conference, um, ladies and gentlemen, co-presidents of the International Peace Bureau, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I'm very pleased, I'm very honored indeed to welcome you, all of you, in Geneva. We are here to award the Sean McBride prize to Jeremy Corbyn. I'm sure I'll get it right by the end of the speech. Um, fraternal welcome to you, sir. Thank you for being with us. This prize is awarded by the International Peace Bureau to a personality distinguished by his or her commitment to serve peace, disarmament, or human rights. Let's perhaps remember who was Sean McBride, not Sean McBird, but Sean McBride, I'll get there in the end, who presided the International Peace Bureau in the 70s. In the 70s. He went into exile, an Irishman, son of a well-known feminist and nationalist celebrity, Maud Gone. His father, John McBride, led an Irish brigade against the British imperial forces in South Africa during the Boer War. His father was executed by the English because he took part in the Easter Rising in 1916 in Dublin. His son was only 12 years old at the time. Sean spent his childhood in Paris. He came back to Ireland at the age of 15 and fought for the independence of Irish Republic. He was in prison. He evaded jail and uh, led a life, a clandestine life. In 1927, he met Ho Chi Minh and Nehru during the Anti-Imperialist Congress in 1936. He resigned from his post as head of staff of clandestine IRA and armed warfare to reunite Ireland. He started off as a lawyer in 1937. He specialized in the defense of uh, political prisoners, Irish Republicans to start off with, and general prisoners. After the setting up of a left-wing party after war, he served as the Irish Minister of Foreign Affairs, and he took part in the drafting of the European Convention on Human Rights in 1950 and set up Amnesty International in the 60s. He was awarded the Peace Nobel Prize in 1974. The list of his anti-colonial engagements in favor of peace and social justice is far too long for even to be mentioned here. On January 1st, 1987, when he was in Geneva, one year before he passed away, Sean McBride gave an interview to the Swiss public television that you can listen to on the internet site. He said that although he was a pacifist, he would have taken up arms against the intolerable regime of apartheid 
apartheid in South Africa if he'd been African. But he also launched a vibrant appeal to abolish nuclear armament. There had uh, been accidents which had just taken place in Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, and he said that they demonstrated if it, this was still necessary, that they needed to be done away with if mankind was to survive. Less than a month before this interview, I, on December 7th, 1986, Geneva citizens voted against the um, atomic nuclear power, and because they had concluded from the Three Mile Island and Chernobyl accidents that they wanted nothing to do with atomic installations, power stations, processing plants, or waste depots. And and uh, therefore, this was laid down in the Constitution of the Republican Canton of Geneva. So, dear Jeremy Corbyn, Vice President of CND, you are being awarded this prize on Geneva soil, which has been politically and materially denuclearized by the will of the people. This is a very opportune award because this prize is being awarded after having awarded the Peace Nobel Prize 2017 to ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. It's an NGO based in Geneva. It's a campaign led by a well coalition of NGOs established in 100 countries that have led to the adoption of a historical treaty banning atomic war Fair, negotiated and voted by 122 countries in July this year in the absence against the will of nine nuclear powers. By the way, there's a representative from uh, the ICANN organization who will receive the prize on behalf of ICANN uh, Oslo, and I regret that this organization is not well supported by Geneva. Last year, they've had to let go more than half of staff in Geneva, and it still cannot find premises in our city, and it is going to be homeless in a few months' time because of the lack of funds. I also regret that Switzerland has neither signed nor ratified the treaty question. We need all of us to campaign for this, and the national councillors in the room, all of us, we need to campaign in favor of the signature and ratification of this treaty. But amongst the nine nuclear powers that didn't take part in the discussion of this treaty, there's Great Britain. Now, we have the honor of having in this room, I'm absolutely convinced of this, the next head of the British government. Because in Great Britain, the neoliberal austerity which has been imposed upon the people increasingly appears to be a machine of war used against the people. Given its obvious effects and the discontent it has led to, the May government is crumbling, reeling hostage of a group of North Irish ultra-reactionaries that are fighting teeth and nail the border of the colonial partition at the risk of calling into question the peace accord for Northern Ireland in 1998. She will not remain at the helm for a long time. Time. The left is a tailwind in Great Britain, and it has tremendous um, challenges to rise to, and the new left Labour Party will have to change the nation's course and put a stop to the neoliberal steamroll. It has to be stopped. It is lethal, literally. Just to give you an example, which is a self-explanatory. On November 15th, the Independent alluded to a study that had been carried out by researchers of the universities of Oxford, Cambridge, and New University College of London. They analyzed the marked change of mortality curves in England to do with the implementation of austerity policies pursued by British conservative governments after the financial crisis. According 
came to the study based on a detailed analysis of national statistical data from 2010 to 2017, the overmortality due to the austerity policy and budgetary cuts in health care and social benefits would have led to additional 120,000 deaths in England, mostly amongst the over 60s and those taken care of by medical social establishments. The study also mentioned cuts in the number of nursing staff, which also helps explain the increase of deaths. But the period going from 2015 to 2020, we can expect additional 150,000 deaths, i.e. 100 per day. One of its co-authors, Professor Lawrence King of the Applied Health Research Unity of Cambridge said, it's quite obvious that austerity neither promotes nor cuts deficits, doesn't promote growth. It's just bad economic policy, but it is, it mirrors our class policy. The study shows that this is a real disaster when it comes to public health. Uh, it's not an exaggeration to speak of mass economic murder. And indeed, the mortality figures highlighted in these studies correspond in an order of magnitude of the effects of two atomic bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki except that this is not an act of war of a foreign government against Great Britain. It's an act of class warfare led by the British government against most of its people on behalf of the super-rich. But today, this is something that is known seen and talked about in England. And we hope that you will put a stop to this, Mr. Corbyn, and that you will be supported by a popular movement along those lines. We've seen that the people of Britain are really upset by what is happening. During this time, as far as nuclear warfare is concerned, the right-wing party with the help Unfortunately, part of the Labour Party is keeping the hands of the British state imperialistic means of planetary genocide by renewing the program of nuclear submarines capable of launching Trident atomic missiles. One of them is patrolling all the time. It has atomic warheads which can strike throughout the world. So what is stake here is a political turnaround. We hope that will abandon the investment program in atomic warfare more than 205 billion sterling pounds, according to the president of the CND, amounts which have been taken from the investment and operational programs which are indispensable in the areas of housing, training, health care, social services, i.e. that are needed to satisfy their social and economic rights of the majority of the British people. How to do away with this contradiction? Will Jeremy Corbyn's Great Britain be the first nuclear power to sign the treaty banning atomic uh, weapons and giving up on its nuclear arsenal? We hope that this will be the case for the British people, for the survival of humankind, and for our host this evening, who we support wholeheartedly in this endeavor. As you will have understood, I'm particularly happy that the price Peace Prize, Sean McBride, Sean McBride, Sean McBride, will be awarded this year to Mr. Jeremy Corbyn. You have done extraordinary work in favor of peace, disarmament, and human rights. Thank you for all these efforts. On behalf of the city of Geneva, I would like to congratulate you more, more, most warmly on this achievement, sir. Your compactivity, your force of conviction that has helped you oppose for 40 years violence and wars, that of Vietnam, that of Iraq, or with the coalition stop the war. My English is not what it should be. You've taken part in setting up and what makes you an ardent defender of the cause of peace, disarmament, human rights. You always have been true to your values, outer globalist, pacifist, anti-nuclear fem feminist, and these values are particularly important in a world which has become particularly inegalitarian. As I come from the trade union movement and I happen to be on the same side of the political spectrum as yourself, sir, allow me to add to these congratulations 
congratulations, my personal solidarity, esteem, and friendship. Thank you for listening. good speech. It's exactly what I had been told to talk about, uh, the story of Sean McBride, who was both the chairman of the board and the president of the International Peace Bureau. I no longer need to do that because you've all heard, even though there was a little bit of trouble in pronouncing his name, you've all heard about Sean McBride and extremely effectively. I would just like to add an aspect of Sean McBride's uh, history that perhaps is dearest uh, to our heart as peace activists, grassroots peace activists. He was always convinced of the importance of non-governmental organizations. He was the president uh, of the NGO Forum as well here in Geneva. Uh, he was a man who believed that peace is, has its foundations on social justice as well. Uh, he was a member of the Pontifical Commission on Justice and Peace. He was a consultant for them. And as you said, he was also the founder and then the chairman of Amnesty and so on. Um, as I was thinking about uh, him and what I was going to say about him on this particular occasion, I went back to read his Nobel acceptance speech in 1974. And I find that uh, I will quote just a few uh, lines from it because I think it's totally appropriate for today. Today that some of us will be leaving tomorrow morning to go to Oslo to celebrate the Nobel Peace Prize given to ICANN, uh, of which we are all part, uh, and that we all feel that this is a movement of civil society that is working for nuclear disarmament, and this is really where our peace commitment lies. Well, in 1974, collecting his Nobel Peace Prize, Sean McBride said, the arsenal of nuclear weapons is now such that there are enough nuclear missiles to destroy the world 20 times over. If any meaningful credibility is to be given to humanitarian law or to the ban on nuclear weapons, the first concrete measure which should be taken is to outlaw the use of nuclear weapons. A simple convention or article in a convention outlawing the use of nuclear weapons would be a fine first simple step. Yet. This has not been done. Of course, this step should be accompanied by provisions to outlaw the manufacture, sale, transfer, or stockpiling of nuclear weapons and the destruction of all existing stocks. Well, it seems to me that the ban treaty that was approved on the 7th of July this year, which is what won the Nobel Peace Prize for ICANN, for the International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons, states just that. Those same words, and many more, are included in the ban treaty. So I think that the Sean McBride Prize this year is ever more appropriate. You know, there are so many reasons to give the McBride Prize to Jeremy Corbyn. I will not speak about many of them, but I would like to mention some. Maybe some which are not so well known. Well known, I think, as a member of parliament, he was voting against every war. And he was very active and is very active in the British peace movement. But he becomes a member of, of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament when he was 15 years old, in the year 1964. And what he has done in these years, I would like to show you in two pictures. 
I think you remember, 15th of, July, 15th of February 2003, one million people were marching through London against the illegal war of Tony Blair against Iraq. And one of the main speakers of this march was Jeremy Coburn. February 2016. Jeremy Coburn was new elected as chair of the Labour Party and the campaign for nuclear disarmament was organizing one of the biggest marches against nuclear weapons, against the modernization of Trident. And who was the final speaker at that cold march, at that cold day? Jeremy Coburn. And I have not to underline that. These two examples say everything upon his long life activities against war and nuclear weapons. These two slides show the reasons IPB decided to give the McBride Award 2017 to Jeremy Coburn. Long life engagement for peace. Fighting for a world without nuclear weapons. And his courage. I think it is not always easy even to be a member of the governmental party to vote against war and for peace when the prime minister starts the war. He was doing this always. More than 300 times he was voting against the majority of his own party. And this courage is important for us and I think it's even more important for the future generations. And all this he was doing a long life and that he is staying here is for me a very positive sign that he will do this in the future. IPB is deeply convinced that Jeremy is standing in the tradition of seeing McBride. That is the reason the board decided to give him the McBride Award 2017. And Lisa and myself are proud now to give him the award we 2017, we have to put it out. This is a secret job. <laughs> so, and you are thinking from there, and Lisa there. Yes, the photographs, there I am. And you are giving the award. And I give it to him. Yes. I put it around his neck. Yeah. <laughs> it's not in yeah. 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 The tree of life, is it? And before Jeremy will definitely get the floor, I have the great pleasure to announce Sharon Barrows, the General Secretary, Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation for the Laudatio for Jeremy. I'm very pleased that, Jer that uh, Sharon could make it. And it shows for me that peace and labor are two sides of this coin. Jeremy is carrying now. Sharon, the floor is to you. Men and women of peace, I'm actually honoured to give this oration in support of the 2000 IPB uh, McBride Peace Prize recipient, the Right Honourable Jeremy Corbyn. When our world is tragically fractured, and there are less than 12 countries in the world that are not engaged in conflict, either directly, in alliance, or through the arms trade, then the horrific reality is that the prevailing global leadership of nations is biased towards conflict and exclusion. And when we see the emergence of dictatorships, even in democratically elected countries, where authoritarianism is driving xenophobia, racism and the silencing of oppositional voices, trammelling democratic rights and freedoms in the process, then fear, division and exclusion can only be further exacerbated. Labor rights defenders, human rights defenders and environmental defenders organise and speak out at the risk of incarceration, disappearance or indeed murder in an ever-increasing number of countries. 
Approximately 560,000 people lost their lives violently in 2016, meaning that on average interpersonal or collective violence killed at least one person every minute of every day of the year. Around 385,000 of them were the victims of international homicides, 99,000 were casualties of war and the rest died in unintentional homicides or due to legal interventions. Our ITUC Global Rights Index shows that in 2017 almost 50 countries deliberately presided over shrinking democratic space for trade unions and civil society organisations. And I would say to you that a measure of democracy is always the level of attacks on our journalist members, those who expose corruption, exploitation and oppression. As an indicator of freedom today, the persecution of journalists is no longer limited to the two dozen or so totalitarian regimes that have dismantled free media, but indeed includes a growing cohort of proclaimed democracies such as Brazil, Turkey, Mexico, Kenya, Poland, Hungary, Cambodia and many others. This is indeed reflected in simultaneous attacks on trade unions and civil society organisations, escalating levels of inequality and historic level of displacement of people and the shameful denial of human rights and exclusions of refugees and migrants from our communities and from our workplaces. And if you add to this mix the reality that the current model of globalisation has failed working people, created the 1% and fuels a division that has allowed fascism, indeed the extreme right in all of its forms, even terrorism to flourish. And you can see the results of, destruction, of the destruction of the social contract, the social settlement post the Great Depression and two world wars. We must change the rules, Jeremy. You know that. You say that almost every day. And to hear the voice of Jeremy Corbyn today at the UN is a beacon of hope. When we're, with the failure of neoliberal orthodoxy in his sights, this Labor leader highlighted four major threats to a common humanity. Climate change, the refugee crisis, a bomb first, think later approach to conflict, and the growing concentration of unaccountable wealth and power in the hands of a tiny corporate elite. And for working people trapped in low wage, insecure and often unsafe work, or even modern slavery, our members, Jeremy Corbyn's pledge that the next Labor government is committed to supporting the efforts of the United Nations for a legally binding instrument on transnational corporations and human rights indeed deepens the possibility of a more just world. For those of us negotiating this... <laughs> for those of us negotiating this, Jeremy, you can't understand how much that was just music to our ears. This is the hope we need. We need it multiplied by a new wave of global leaders, leaders like Jeremy Corbyn, that the world's people so desperately require. And when he points out the devastation created in countries like Yemen, when many of our nations sell arms to Saudi Arabia, we can indeed champion an honest and courageous man in our midst. And we know that in fact the IPB is running a campaign around disarmament more broadly and we support that with the global labour movement 100%. But this award is even more significant in the year that the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to ICANN for its long-standing fight for a nuclear-free world and, of course, the Ban Treaty. A presentation, though, that sends a clear message as we stand once again on the precipice of a global nuclear th threat. Whether that threat is emanating from the US, the North Korean-US provocation, or from the rejection by the US of the agreement with Iran, or this week the divisive and disrespectful unilateral proclamation of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Nuclear disarmament is a cause as urgent as at any time in our history. Thus to see the McBride Prize awarded to this great Labor leader who joined the campaign for nuclear disarmament as you heard when he was just a teenager and remains a leader 
for the cause is both justified and welcome. But for Jeremy Corbyn, the commitment to peace is in his DNA and he's repeatedly shown, as you've heard, his courage as he stood up publicly and in the parliament for his beliefs. This, this is best described, might I say, in his own words. And I quote, my own political views were shaped by the horrors and the threats of a nuclear holocaust. My generation grew up under the shadow of the Cold War. I was haunted by the images of civilians in Vietnam fleeing chemical weapons used by the US. I didn't imagine 50 years later we would see chemical weapons still being used against innocent civilians. This man will break the mould. He has promised to create a ministry for peace. We would hope, Jeremy, it's the first of many such ministries. When Jeremy Corbyn says, you don't achieve peace by planning for war, by grabbing resources, and by not respecting each other's human rights, this has to be the basis of a turning point for our future. Jeremy Corbyn is joined by very few other le leaders around the world. Let me just acknowledge one other Labor leader, the Prime Minister of Sweden, Stefan Löfven, who has launched the call for a new global deal where tripartite dialogue shapes the design of the future of work with respect for human and labour rights, rather than the mindless exploitation in a world now driven by corporate greed. In the lead up to the UN 70th anniversary of human rights and the ILO centenary of 2019, <coughs> with um, indeed being strengthened then in 1944 by the Philadelphia Declaration, we must remind ourselves that these global standards were built from the ashes of war and, re and, and reaffirm as relevant today when the challenge is to strengthen the global rule of law. Jeremy, in your young working life, you were a union organiser with the National Union of Public Employees, now known as Unison. So I think you can be very proud when I say that unions are still on the front lines of peace and democracy, from South Africa to Ireland, Indonesia, Angola, Guinea, Rwanda, Tunisia indeed, where unions and civil society were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for dialogue just two years ago. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, Zimbabwe, Bahrain, Myanmar, Colombia, Turkey, Brazil, Syria, the Philippines, Palestine, even the US and dozens more. We will never give up the fundamental struggle for democracy and peace. Peace, democracy, uh, democratic rights and freedoms, that's the basis of a just world. So just two weeks ago, we were actually at the Vatican and we reinforced these values. And I have to tell you that it, it wasn't just Catholics. It's people like me who aren't religious. There were Hindus, Baptists, Protestants. Name a religion and our movement was there, united in the, uh, in the determination to change the world, to turn it on its fulcrum. And of course, next week, I'm proud to tell you that we'll have our own peace summit where we will initiate a series of intergenerational conversations for peace and democracy. The global union movement stands against racism and xenophobia and for migrants and refugees. We stand against modern slavery. We stand for universal social protection, minimum living wages and collective bargaining as the tools of shared prosperity and inclusion. We stand against the misogyny that has been unleashed today by these strong right-wing male leaders and all forms of discrimination. And again, and against a global model based on corporate greed. And we stand for reform, indeed, of a strong multilateral system that is based on the values we all share with a genuine global rule of law. Above all, we stand for peace. And while I can't be at the award ceremony tomorrow, this weekend, indeed Philip Jennings, who's here, will represent us as we stand in, as a value set alongside ICANN in our commitment to disarmament and just transition for workers. As, as the member for Islington North, with its high immigration population, Jeremy Corbyn is indeed joined in that constituent by a great sister of mine and another amazing Labor leader, Frances O'Grady. And indeed, uh, 
so it, with, with Francis in mind, Jeremy, with Philip and many other union colleagues here, with the men and women of peace standing here tonight, but mostly on behalf of the ITUC family, who has around 2 million, 200 million, I should say, members worldwide, we are proud of you. And I'm personally proud to stand with you in solidarity as you are recognised for the values shared by the global labour movement and as you deservedly accept this prestigious award for your commitment to peace, I say thank you, Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Sharon, for these words, I think, which is describing more than the reality and gives us the hope and the power also for our future fights. You know, before I will give the floor to Jeremy, I have the great opportunity to, to thank someone who was helping us to organizing this event next to the mayor, the World Democratic Forum, Jean Rousseau, without him and his support, we never could arrange this event in such a short time. Jeremy, the floor is now to you. Monsieur le maire, merci beaucoup. <laughs> merci pour ce travail, pour votre travail, et merci pour votre maison. C'est très joli. <laughs> Friends, thank you very much. I'm very, very honored to receive the prize in memory of Sean McBride, a man who spent his life searching for peace, searching for justice, and searching for truth. Grew up in Ireland, in all the troubled history of Ireland. He never forgot where he came from. He went on to become a TD, to make a massive contribution to the rest of the world through the foundation of Amnesty International and through his work in the United Nations for peace and disarmament and ultimately to receive the Nobel Prize. There can be no fitting tribute now that I can get the Nobel Prize this weekend in Oslo. I think we can join our hands together in congratulating them on this amazing achievement. And I want to say thank you to Sharon for what she just said and the work that she, on behalf of trade unions all across the world, put together and the way in which uh, she put it about working people and their lives. I also want to thank Rainer for his work because of um, his efforts through the uh, International Peace Bureau and that of Lisa through the International Peace Bureau, we have the maintenance of a body in, the, in Geneva and around the world that is totally dedicated to peace and disarmament. As he kindly said, I um, come from a family that were dedicated to peace. Indeed, my mum and dad were both very involved in peace activities, and indeed my mother was at Greenham Common and uh, going around opposing nuclear weapons throughout her life. And in my membership of CND, throughout my life, I've made many very good friends and understood a great deal about the work of CND as a former uh, national officer of CND. And I'm really pleased that there's so many friends here from CND. And then the campaigns that go on about wars. You very kindly brought up that lovely photograph of me taken in 2003. It only feels like yesterday. <laughs> um, but that was an amazing experience. The government of the day, led by Tony Blair, decided they had to go along with George Bush and the invasion of Iraq. Many of us thought very differently. This war was unnecessary, it was wrong, and it was going to kill people. And what I said on the stage there, and I stand by it absolutely, was this war is wrong, this war is unnecessary, this war will leave behind it a terrible wake of devastation, destruction, loss of life, bitterness, hatred, 
and ultimately a growth of more wars and more terrorism and more refugees all around the world. Sadly, I asked myself, where was I wrong in anything I said in February 2003? The following day after that demonstration, or indeed that night, I went to New York and then on to San Francisco for another anti-war demonstration the following day in, in front of the City Hall in San Francisco, where there was a crowd not as big as London, but then it is a smaller city, absolutely massive crowd of young and middle-aged and older Americans who were equally angry about the war in Iraq and said it wasn't done in their name. And those people that stood then and stood against subsequent wars and invasions are really the heroes of our time. We organized that day events in 600 cities all around the world. There was a world outpouring against that war. And we have to build on that forever and understand the importance of peace movements. Today, I was invited to speak to the United Nations about our ideas on internationalism, our ideas on peace, and our ideas on justice. And I set out the issues that the world faces. Climate change, the refugee crisis, grotesque levels of inequality, unaccountable power of multinational corporations. And how the majority of the world's population don't own very much, the majority of the world's population don't feel very secure, and at any one time now, there are 66 million people who are refugees around the world. Think of that figure, 66 million people. That is slightly larger than the entire population of the United Kingdom are refugees around the world today. They're refugees because of environmental degradation and disaster. They're refugees because of human rights abuses in their societies. They're refugees because of land grabs. They're refugees from dictatorships and those that would prevent them living a decent life. And they're refugees from wars. So are we just to put the shutters up and pretend it will go away? Build barbed wire to protect ourselves against the influx of refugees everywhere around the world? Or are we to say, actually, you cannot go on creating greater inequality in the world, turning a blind eye to environmental destruction and arming yourselves for future conflicts without actually making the world an infinitely more dangerous place in the long run. And so we put forward the proposals we have about um, control of what multinational corporations do, about challenging the tax havens that shelter the billions that have been taken from the very poorest in this world, whilst the social services in the industrial countries suffer from a process called austerity, which in reality has been a mask for a greater transfer of wealth to the wealthiest minorities in the world? Or do we offer a different economic agenda, a different narrative, and an alternative? You can deal with a problem by blaming somebody. You can blame a minority. You know, it happens all across Europe. You blame minority A, they'll blame minority B, blame somebody else, blame a refugee, blame a migrant. That's why there's a shortage of houses, that's why there's a shortage of hospitals, that's why there's a school waiting list. And you know what? When you blame somebody, you have to blame somebody else because the first blame doesn't work. Then you blame somebody else. And then you go down and down, a horrible vortex which leads you to nowhere. At the end of all that blame process, You've created hate, you've created distrust, you've created a nasty atmosphere. You haven't built one house, trained one teacher, employed one nurse, or taught one child. Yeah. And so I was trying to set out what um, sort of alternatives we would put forward. And when we came to question and answer, my friend Alan Ware, who's over here, um, asked a question about um, what happens in the future on nuclear weapons. I welcome the ban of achievement that went through the UN this year, and I want to see my country play its full part in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in all its aspects. I want to see a world where we do get rid of nuclear weapons. 
I want to see a world where we bring India, Pakistan, and North Korea back into the NPT process. And I simply say this to President Trump and Kim Jong-un, shouting at each other, threatening a nuclear attack from either direction, is not going to do anything other than increase the danger and increase the likelihood of a terrible, terrible disaster. A nuclear weapon knows no boundaries. One set off anywhere will affect somebody else very, very quickly and will kill large numbers of civilians in the process. It's the voice of peace and the voice of reason that has to be heard all around the world. And that is what we have to do. And so I feel very, very honored to receive this uh, award today. And um, in thinking about it, I often think of those that have um, written, activated, and done a great deal in their lives. And um, we sometimes measure war and peace by the existence of fighting or not. We have a world where we've been through in Europe two massive wars that have left millions dead. The war memorials are around us in every town and every city. Yet, since the Second World War, there have been so many other conflicts. Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and many, many other savage, smaller, more localized wars, often about resources, often about power. All of them accompanied by an abuse of human rights, huge refugee flows, and many children losing their lives or losing their hopes and opportunities. We cannot go on in a world where we could be so wealthy, we could be so well off, we could sustain our planet, but instead we go in the opposite direction. I was thinking of the words that Arundhati Roy wrote in her wonderful book, The Great God of Small Things, but something she said some years later was very profound. She said, um, for some people, not having a war is when there is no fighting visibly around them. But for others, the war is every day. The war is not having enough to eat, not having clean water for your children, not having a school for your children to go to, and not having the prospects of ever being able to sustain your whole family. That is the consequence of economic war, as well as that of the hot wars that we talk about. Sean McBride gave his life to peace, gave his life to human rights, and it's um, a great honor to me to be uh, offered the prize, the Sean McBride Prize, and I thank everyone here for coming and for the work all of you do, because if you want to achieve change, it comes from within ourselves, and it comes from being prepared to activate yourself in a cause you believe to be right. None of the rights we've got, the right to vote, the right of women to vote, the right of disabled people to have full place in society, the right to be gay, to be disabled, the right to represent and uh, put yourself forward, always came, always came from people standing up, often against abuse and ridicule, but standing up and saying, this is how the world ought to be. Those human rights defenders around the world that risk their lives every day to challenge an unaccountable police force, to challenge a torturer, to challenge somebody being taken away from their home in the dead of night, or those very brave journalists that do challenge all of this. They're the heroes on which our liberties depend. Why don't we make all of ourselves the voice of human rights defenders and peace activists and those that want a different and a better world. It's not for us individually, it's for all of humanity and for the generations to come. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. I can't even get in there, there's so much clapping. My task now is just, my task now 
is to have one final thank you, which is uh, the peace bronze from which the medal, the Sean McBride medal was made of, comes from, from War to Peace, which is a non-profit making organization in the United States that uses old uh, nu dismantled nuclear warheads, not radioactive. <laughs> not radioactive. Is this a Geiger count? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's also in its content, as well as in its symbolism, an important award. Uh, and then I have a very private message to Germany, to Jeremy, because I live in Italy, I come from Italy, and as I was telling people that I was going to come here today uh, to, to uh, give you the Sean McBride Award, uh, the uh, question from many people was, can you ask him to come to Italy? We really need him there. So I'm sure you're needed in lots of countries, but please, please keep Italy top of your list. Okay. Um, now, the... Message received. Okay. The reception is through those doors. Yes. And the International Peace Bureau, through me and uh, Reiner, really wishes to thank all of you for coming. This is fantastic. Of course, to thank Sharon and uh, the mayor, Mayor Pagani, who is also of an Italian origin, Italian tradition. So there we are, uh, even though Swiss Italian, I think. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for hosting us here. And I think at this point, we have all stood for a long time. It has been wonderfully worth it. But now we can move a bit and go into the next room to the reception. Thank you.